Good morning again, everyone, and to all those who will join us online later. We welcome you on as we come into this um, second Sunday of December. We're reminded, of course, of what this season is all about. And, and uh, in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, the men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Where is the Christ to be born? And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, O you Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people, Israel. And we know today that Israel is very much in the news today, but you know, we must never forget that in Israel, the Savior, the promised Savior, was born. In Israel, he was put to death, and he died. In Israel, he was buried. In Israel, he rose again. And in Israel, or from Israel, he ascended into heaven, and today we know he is seated at God's right hand in glory. But to Israel, he is coming again to rule and reign, to take up his rightful place on the throne of his forefather, David, to rule and reign back again to Israel. So whatever is going on in Israel today, we know this Bible, the scripture says there will be wars and rumors of wars. But whatever is going on today, we know that God has his eye on Israel. Yes, Israel as a nation are in rebellion against God. They, 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 he came to them and they didn't recognize him. But for those who did, he gave the right to become children of God. So through their rejection, acceptance was open for the Gentiles, for you and me. We thank God for that today. But we know that Jesus, who is and was an Israelite, has his eye on his people and his land. And we too must keep our eyes and our prayers on Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the children of Israel. And will live forever because of Christmas day. I'm going to go in
Jesus, both now and forever. You alone are our plea, Lord God. Because, Lord, the chains of sin have been released once and for all, Lord God. And because they have, Lord, we can sing, We are free. But yet, not us, but through Christ in us. Free from sin, but slaves to you, Lord God. And Lord, you have put inside us, Lord God, the desire to follow you. The desire deep inside is that every breath we take, with every breath we would long, Lord, to follow you. For you alone have promised that you will bring us home, Lord God. Lord, in this world we don't know our days, but we do know your promise that you will satisfy us with the length of days we have. And in the end, you will show us your salvation because you promised to bring us all day by day. We know you're renewing us and you will continue, Lord, until that day when we stand with John before your children, our God. For when our race is run, still our lips will repeat, yet not I, but through you, Christ, in me, Lord. And today, once again, our in obedience your command. On the night you were betrayed, and you took the cup, you took the bread, and you broke it, and you said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, you took the cup, and you said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the sins of all mankind. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, the Lord's death until he come again. So today, Lord, again, we, we, once again, Lord, we take, we obey, we remember, and we proclaim.
come to me is search my word for truth. Search my word for the meaning of life. Dig deep. Come close to me. Draw in. Draw near. I will fulfill you. I will fulfill your purpose. I will fulfill your plans, your desires, because they're for me. Be patient and learn to listen. Be attentive to my word as I speak to your heart. My word is truth. There's no need to be afraid. Trust me as I guide you, as I bring you to the next level. Trust me and move on with me. Fear is not from me. I will guide you. I will be with you. Speak my word and speak it boldly because my word is true. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your speaking voice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Scripture also has come to me as the deer is first to the water, so on heart, so will first be you, Lord. And I feel that the Lord is calling us to thirst for more, thirst for more of Him. He wants to give us all that we need, all that our hearts desire. So thirst, thirst, and seek and listen. Those who may tune into the broadcast and not understand what just transpired, and the Holy Spirit gives certain gifts to those who would uh, believe in Jesus, those who are followers of Jesus, and um, some of those gifts are the ability to bring prophetic uh, messages as the Spirit gives the messages. And today, what you heard earlier on was I brought a message in the in a language that is not understood, it's uh, given by the power of the Holy Spirit, and um, it's a prophetic message. And then somebody else will have the gift of what's called interpretation to be able to interpret it. It's not a, a translation, it's a, not a word for word translation, it's an interpretation. And what you heard then was Patricia about the interpretation as she felt the Spirit giving her the uh, utterance in a language that we all understand, because if we don't hear it in the language we understand, then we simply don't understand it. So that's just, uh, in case you're wondering what actually transpired there, uh, you'll find that in the book of Corinthians. Uh, does anybody else have anything this morning that they feel the Lord has put on their hearts? Just got the, the word prepared away for the Lord. Just because we're coming out of Christmas time, we're preparing for Christmas, that we can prepare ourselves for whatever the Lord's bringing us into. Yeah. And then I'm going to speak in the tongues. I wish it felt like an anointing at all. Yeah. I did not think it was going to go quickly. Yeah. And this, and I did, did get that at all. <coughs> you shall, shall consecrate them 
that they may be most holy. For whoever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. Mm -hmm. It shall not be poured on any body of the ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on the outside of it, shall be cut off from its people. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. What should we think of that? Yeah. Of course, the anointing is for God's people, you know, as well. It's not so it's just like anointing with oil, oil when you were praying with God. That he is anointing us with oil, is it? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah, we receive that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your anointing that's pouring out, Lord God, like rain. Lord, we stand and we receive, Lord God, what you're pouring out upon us Amen. in the spiritual realm, Lord God. We receive it now with Amen. open hearts, Lord God. We receive it, Lord God. All you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. My Lord. Yeah, I was given a prophetic message yesterday, and I believe it's not just for me, I believe it's for. It's for all of us, and the message was that um, I have sown in certain places, sown in, 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 in the field, but that there's a harvest in a higher field. And the scripture says, you will reap where you have not sown, but there's a harvest in a higher field. It's like, what the person said, it's like it's six foot higher than the field you're looking at for, um, for a harvest, even though there will be a harvest in that field, there's a greater harvest in a higher field. And of course the lower field always refers to the fields, you know, that's more susceptible to be flooded and maybe the maybe the, the, the soil isn't isn't as rich. The higher field may have richer soil, I don't know. But the, the message and I believe it's for all of us as I said that you have sown. You have sown in certain areas. And there will be a harvest there. But you're going to reap a harvest where you have not sown. Others have sown. Others have watered. But because you've been faithful in place where God has planted you and you have sown faithfully as God has has given you direction that you will see a harvest in a field where you have not sown and it's a higher field and I believe that's that's not just for me I believe it's for, for all of us amen amen well praise the Lord it's good to see us today and good to see us all and a uh, few folks who are sick will continue to remember them Heather and Elaine and uh, keep them in your, in your prayers. Danny as well. Danny is still in the hospital and uh, when he is improving he still uh, needs to stay in I mean, for a while a while longer. So keep the family in your prayers and anybody else, uh, Michelle as well, keep her in prayer and anybody else that uh, um, needs prayer, we pray for each other. Amen. 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 Well the title of today's message is topical, it's uh, current. Israel, Hamas, and the end times. And we, we touched briefly on this on Wednesday night when we talked about um, the children of Israel, the people of Israel, and how they, they're living in rebellion and, and in disobedience, and they're, they're still there in that place today. We know some of the Jewish people get saved, and we refer to them as Messianic Jews, but the majority of the Jewish people are still unfortunately waiting for their Messiah. Um, as we see later on, it's a bit different than other days. But the question, I suppose, is, are we living in the end times? And many would say, yes, we are. And some would even believe that we will see the Lord come in our day, and definitely, if not in our day, at least in the next, next generation. And as people of God, we are to know and to understand the times that we live in. Uh, First Chronicles 12, 32, talking about the, the men who stood with David, it says of Issachar, men who add understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. <coughs> Excuse me, men who add understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Well, the eyes of the world are, 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 
are fixed securely on Israel and the war in Gaza at the moment. So the question is, how are we as followers of Christ to respond? We're not Israel, we're the church. Israel and the church are two separate entities. Israel is not the church, the church is the church. There are some Messianic Jews, as I said, who are in the church, but Israel is not the church, and we are not Israel. We are the children of God. There's a difference. Now, in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, uh, Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We don't have the scripture up. But to put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, the tricks and the, the plans of the devil. Our battle is never and never will be and should not be against flesh and blood. In other words, our fellow man. But if our focus is on world news, we will take sides, depending on how much of the world news we take in. And our battle will be against flesh and blood, and we'll rise up against things we shouldn't rise up against. And this is exactly what Satan wants us to do. Instead, we are to be aware of his evil schemes. You see, the real enemy of man is not man. The real enemy of man are the rulers and authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. So if I was to ask someone who or what is Hamas, most wouldn't really know. And those who do know what or who Hamas are know that their one objective is to destroy Israel and the Jewish people. But again, the real reason for this obsession is often vague, to say the least. The history of the Palestinians in the land of Israel is not taught in schools, nor is it taught in church. And the result is that most believers don't really know much about it. Now in the past two months since, since the, the terrorists uh, in, came into Israel and, and committed some, such atrocities, many have come out in support of what they call the Palestinian cause. Mostly because of what's happening now in Gaza. Or at least because of what the news is telling people about the war in Gaza. And sad to say, this also includes many followers of Christ. But what's happening in, 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 in Palestine right now is in fact part of biblical prophecy concerning the end times. Now I'm no expert on what's happening in Gaza right now, but today we're going to hear from someone who knows enough about it to be able to give us an understanding of the times we're living in. Now his name is Gary Hamrick, and he's the pastor of a church in the US. I know very little about him, but after listening to this message twice, I can say, I know enough to know this. I want to know what he knows. And I want this knowledge because I want to know how best to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the children of Israel. So we're going to, we're going to watch his message. And he's a man who has uh, so much, who's somewhat of an expert on Israel, not just now, but you know, in the past. So this is Gary Hamrick and his message today. For today I'm going to be... For today I'm going to be bringing a message with a biblical perspective relating to current events unfolding in Israel. Why is it important for us to keep our eye on Israel? Um, first, because the Bible is a book about Israel. The Bible records historically things about Israel, and the Bible records prophetically things that are yet to happen in Israel. In addition, of course, God gave a Savior to the world, his name is Jesus, who was born in Israel, died in Israel, rose again in Israel, and by the way, is coming again to Israel. And so we need to keep our eye on Jesus. And so that's why I'm delving into this, to bring a biblical perspective to what, we're seeing, what we see happening in the Middle East. Today, actually, I was supposed to be broadcasting from Israel back here to the church a video for this morning's teaching, uh, leading a group of a couple hundred from our church. And thankfully, um, the, you know, we weren't there when the war broke out. Um, so we thank the Lord for that. One day before Terry and I were supposed to board an airplane to fly to Israel, on Saturday last week, Saturday, October the 7th, 2023, 1,500 Hamas terrorists penetrated the security fence around Gaza, 
came into Israel on motorcycles, jeeps, and paragliders from the air and brutally, savagely murdered Israelis at this music festival in Rain. And then they went on to raid several kibbutzim along the border there with Gaza, murdering, you've heard the stories, I don't need to go over the details, but it was brutal and, and it, there's nothing to describe it other than using the words pure evil. This is a picture of the face of this war. This is a young couple. Her name is Hadar, his name is Atai Bredichevsky, and they're twin babies. They lived in a kibbutz called Kafar Aza, near the border with Gaza. Their kibbutz was stormed by Hamas terrorists, along with other kibbutz. When they heard Hamas gunmen approaching their home, they quickly took their twin babies and hid them in a safe room in their home and then came back out, engaged with these Hamas terrorists, and this young couple was brutally murdered. Fourteen hours later, when the Israeli Defense Force took back Kafar Azad, they found those twin babies unharmed, alive, and they rescued those little babies who are now orphans because terrorists killed their mom and dad. Those parents gave their lives in defense of their children. This is the face of that war. For the first time in 50 years, since 1973 in the Yom Kippur War, for the first time in 50 years, Israel has now officially declared war in response to Hamas terrorism. It is, as people are saying, Israel's 9-11. But here's what they're not always saying, which is that when you look at proportionally the population of Israel, which is about 7.1 million Jews, compared to the population of the United States, which is around 330 million Americans, their 9-11, Israelis' 9-11, proportionally the number of deaths compared to our number of deaths on 9-11 is 30 times worse for Israel. Let that sink in. 30 times worse in terms of the numbers. I want to say from the outset that our church is unequivocally standing with Israel and the Jewish people. I also want to say that just as there were in the 1930s and 1940s, some sensible Germans who were opposed to Hitler and Nazism, there are also today some sensible Palestinians who are opposed to Hamas and Islamic terrorism and who believe also in Israel's right to exist. And to those Palestinians, we also say we're standing with you too. So I'm devoting the entirety of today's teaching to try to answer these five questions. Number one, who or what is Hamas? Number two, why is Hamas so in intent on destroying Israel and the Jewish people? Number three, what is the history of the Palestinians and the land of Israel? Number four, why are so many American youth and young adults supporting the Palestinian cause today? Number five, how might any of this fit into Bible prophecy about the end times? So let's start with the word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, our hearts are heavy today as we are really so far removed from what is happening in Israel, yet at the same time, because we love you and we love our Bibles, we also love the Jewish people, and we thank you for the redemptive plan for the universe that came through the Jewish people through a Jewish Messiah whose name is Jesus, Yeshua. And Lord, while our hearts are heavy, at the same time, our hope is in you. And we thank you, Psalm 121, that you who watch over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So we pray for their peace. We pray for their protection. We pray for a quick end to this war. We know, Lord, that ultimately peace will only come when you, the, the Prince of Peace, come again. But Lord, until that time, we ask for you to be merciful and to intervene 
And Lord, as your word tells us to, in Psalm 122, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So Lord, we do that. And we ask you, Lord, please help, please intervene. Please show yourself strong on behalf of the nation of Israel. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Here's the first question. Who or what is Hamas? Hamas is a terrorist organization made up of Sunni Muslims. Hamas, the name of the organization, is actually an acronym that it translates from Arabic, the Islamic Resistance Movement. So it is, it is an acronym that the group has used. However, the word Hamas itself, it's kind of a dual play on words, because Hamas in Arabic means zeal or strength. It's interesting, in Hebrew, the word Hamas is also a Hebrew word spelled C-H-A-M-A-S, and Hamas in Hebrew means violence, violence. Uh, a more appropriate definition of what Hamas is all about. Hamas does not care about anyone or anything that stands in the way of their one mission, which is to kill Jews and to wipe Israel off the map. I'm not saying this, this is what their own charter says. The Hamas Covenant, the Hamas Charter, which was adopted in 1988, in part says this. This is the opening paragraph, quote, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. And also Article 7 says, quote, the day of judgment would not come until the Muslims fight and kill the Jews. So they are bold in making this declaration. This is not you know, conspiracy, this is not, you know, false information. They have a desire to kill Jews and to wipe Israel off the map and to establish it as an Islamic state. And they will kill and destroy anything and anyone who stands in the way of that mission. And not just Jews. They also don't care about Palestinians. Hamas uses Palestinians as human shields. Hamas intentionally sets up rocket launchers at schools and hospitals and civilian apartment buildings, knowing that when Israel retaliates, it will be wonderful optics for Hamas when it shows innocent civilians killed in hospitals and schools, looking like Israel was targeting those things. Now Israel is targeting the rocket launchers that Hamas intentionally sets up there because they are using Palestinian civilians as human shields. They've even prevented their own Palestinian people from exiting Gaza City. Have you been hearing this? Listen, by the way, what nation drops leaflets in the language of that nation and tells them in advance, you better get out, we're coming in for the bad guys? But that's what Israel's been doing. They've been dropping, dropping leaflets from the sky in Arabic, telling Palestinian civilians, exit the northern part of the Gaza, go down to the south, because we're about ready to come into Hamas and destroy Hamas. We're coming into the northern part of Gaza first, we're giving you advance notice. Do you know what the terrorists are doing? Hamas terrorists are, have actually kept 170,000 Palestinians from exiting Gaza City itself as a sign of solidarity. Stand with us. We're forcing you to stand with us and to stay here. They don't care. They don't even care about, listen to this. When that music concert was happening in Raheem, it was mostly attended to by Jews, but there were some Arab Israelis there who were killed as well. In Israel, you have not just Jews living in Israel proper. You have Arab Israeli citizens. These are Arabs who are either Muslim or Christians. Okay, I just spoke to, I've had an Arab Israeli as a bus driver on our tours to Israel for the past 25 years. He just called me two days ago. His name is Munir Sayed. Munir is an Arab. He's a Christian. He became a believer in Jesus about 10, 15 years ago. And he lives presently in Nazareth. They live, they work, they raise families in Israel proper, and they peacefully coexist with Jews. There were some Arab Israelis at that music concert. Hamas didn't care. They killed them too. See, they don't care. They will kill Jews. They will kill Palestinians. They will kill anyone and anything that stands in their way of the mission to kill Jews and to wipe Israel off the map because... Hamas is an evil, demonic ideology, and they want to advance their agenda at whatever cost, whatever cost. 
So let me walk to the back wall here and give you a timeline of the history of Hamas. This is very brief. This is a brief summary. 1987, Hamas was founded in Gaza by Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a Palestinian cleric, as an offshoot of the Egyptian-based Muslim Brotherhood. In 1988, Hamas published its charter calling for the destruction of Israel and the establishment of an Islamic state in its place. I just read you a couple excerpts from their covenant or their charter. Then in 1991, its military wing, the Izzedine al Hassan Brigades, was established. In 1993, Hamas began suicide bombings in Israel just prior to the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords was intended to bring some peace between Israel and the Palestinians. But you see, Hamas is opposed to the Palestinian Authority because they don't think that they think the Palestinian Authority is too secular and Hamas is more violent. The Oslo Accords gave the Palestinian Authority autonomy and limited authority in Gaza and the West Bank. So in 1997, Hamas was designated a terrorist organization by the United States and dozens of other countries in response to the groups Iran supported use of explosives and rockets along with suicide bombings and kidnappings to target Israel. In 2000, they started their deadly intifada. This is actually the second intifada. That's just an Arabic word that means uprising. It was a deadly intifada of Palestinians against Israelis. That's when you started to see the Israeli uh, uh, government put up a fence to protect themselves. In 2005, Israel evacuated all their troops and settlers from Gaza and built a security fence around Gaza itself for Israel's national security. In 2006, Hamas won a surprise victory in Palestinian parliamentary elections and then seized full control of Gaza, overthrowing forces loyal to Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. As a result, much of the international community cut off aid to Gaza because they did not want to finance a terrorist-sponsored territory. You begin to see all the suffering of the Palestinian people. Israel gets blamed a lot for that. Israel has been supplying up until this war electricity, humanitarian aid, food, allowing people from Gaza to come over for work. The international community realized when a terrorist organization begins to run a territory, we can't continue to finance that, at least not at the same level. And then, of course, on October the 7th, 2023, Hamas terrorists penetrated the security fence around Gaza, and 1,500 terrorists entered Israel and attacked, slaughter, and abduct Jews in the worst mass murdering of Jews since the Holocaust. Ladies and gentlemen, the Palestinian people in Gaza have no one to blame except Hamas for their poor living conditions, for their isolation, and for now the defensive war that Israel is waging in that region. Hamas is responsible for the poor conditions that the Palestinians are experiencing in the land and the territory of Gaza. These protesters in the United States who are holding up signs that say, Free Palestine, Free Palestine, it should say, Free Palestine from Hamas. Hamas is responsible for their suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 2006, when Hamas came to power through parliamentary elections, instead of taking finances that they had accumulated to help build infrastructure in Gaza, to help assist with humanitarian aid, instead of building factories, they took their finances and they built tunnels underground, hundreds of them. And they also amassed munition to target Israel. So they took all their resources and they devoted it to the destruction of Israel rather than helping to improve the condition of the Palestinian people that they supposedly represent. So number two, the question is then, why is Hamas so intent on destroying Israel and the Jewish people? There are ideological answers to this, there are political answers, and even religious answers. But I'm going to give you the spiritual answer, the biblical answer. Why is Hamas so intent on destroying the Jewish people and wiping Israel off the map? You really could trace it all the way back to animosity in the book of Genesis. Abraham had a son of the covenant, his name was Isaac. But Abraham, in a moment of flesh, slept with Hagar, a slave woman from Egypt. It was not part of the will of God, the plan of God, and a son was born, his name was Ishmael. 
The descendants of Ishmael are the Arab people. The descendants of Isaac, the promise that was revealed through the child Isaac, Abraham's son, are the Jewish people. There's been an animosity between the children of Ishmael and the children of Isaac since the book of Genesis. And it is basically over jealousy of the promise. In a nutshell, that's really what it is. But to be more specific, ladies and gentlemen, the, the vitriol, the animosity, the hatred of Hamas and others like them towards the Jewish people is plain and simple. It is incited by Satan himself because anti-Semitism is Satanism. And that's exactly what it is. The hatred of Jewish people is something that Satan incites among individuals, nations, and groups of people. And why? Why does Satan do this? Listen to Revelation 12, verse 4. It says this, And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. What does that speak of? It speaks of a dragon, a woman, and a child. In Revelation 12, 4, the dragon is a picture of Satan. The woman is a picture of Israel. The child that she gave birth to is the ultimate child of the promise, who is Jesus. Satan, the dragon, has always stood opposed to the redemptive plan of God. He has done everything he can to hinder, thwart, and to uh, um, totally ruin, in whatever way he can, the redemptive plan of God that was revealed through a particular nation. And this is how God chose to do it. Humanity in its sinful condition needed a savior to rescue all of us. God in his providence chose a single individual, Avram, Abram, who later God would change his name to Abraham. Avram was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. There were no Jewish people. Abraham was living in on a map what today would be Iraq. And God called this man and, and, and tapped him on the shoulder and called him to come to a land that God would give him and his descendants so that through the seed of this man, a race of people, a nation of people would be born. The people of Israel, the Jewish people. And that ultimately through this race of people would come one Jewish Messiah who would be a savior, not just for the Jews, but a savior for the entire world because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Satan hates the redemptive plan of God. And because the redemptive plan of God was centered and located in Israel, which is where the Savior was born, died, rose again, ascended from, and is coming again to, Satan is doing everything he can to bring the attention of an evil world with all their hatred and animosity against this one location because it represents the covenant redemptive plan of God. And Satan has been inspiring nations and people and groups of people from the beginning of time to hate the Jewish people because they represent the ultimate redemptive plan of God. And God says in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. His eye is on this land because he chose this particular location and among these particular people through which to reveal his ultimate redemptive plan for the sake of the whole world. So if you've ever wondered why all the hatred for the Jews, why all the fuss over a little country smaller than the state of New Jersey, that's where it comes from. Anti-Semitism is Satanism. This is a spiritual war that we're seeing happening here. Well, sure, it's being fought in physical ways, but this is a spiritual war inciting all of this. So that's the real answer. Now, I will tell you that the populist answer, okay, the common narrative that you, that you hear as to why Hamas has attacked um, Israel and why many Palestinians support uh, what Hamas has done is because they believe that Israel and the Jewish people are occupying land that belongs to the Palestinian people. And thus, a lot of times you'll hear, especially among the protesters who are uh, pro-Palestinian and anti-Semitic, they will say that Israel are the occupiers. You've heard them say that. They're the colonialists. And, and so we're just trying to take back our land. So to, to many today, they believe that this conflict is really based on Israel's uh, illegitimate right to the land and 
and Hamas is trying to take it back for their own people and for Islamic cause. Which leads us now to the third question, which is, what is the history of the Palestinians and the land of Israel? So let me just say this, to just be clear from the beginning of, of answering this third question. The Jews are not occupiers. If you know your history at all, the Jews are the indigenous people of the land. They are the indigenous people of the land. They were living in this land 2,100 years before anyone was ever called or referred to as Palestinian. They were there 2,100 years before anyone was ever referred to as a Palestinian. And they were living in that land 2,600 years before Islam was ever a religion. 2,600 years before Islam was ever even a religion. Now, for those who don't want to embrace or believe the Bible as an historical record of the fact that the Jews were living there thousands of years before there was a Palestinian, thousands of years before there was Islam, then at least look at the archeological evidence, okay? Because there's an Egyptian stele, which is basically a stone slab, which is an ancient slab with markings on it. There's an ancient Egyptian stele from the 13th century BC that speaks of Israel by name as the land. There's also a Canaanite stele from the 9th century BC that refers by name to King David as king of the land of Israel. So if you don't want to believe the Bible, then look at some of the archaeological evidence. Because for thousands of years, it has been a well-documented fact that the Jews lived in this land as God had given it to them. But here's what happened, and here's why others claim, no, this is our land. Because from 586 BC, from when the Babylonians came and besieged Israel, until 1948 AD, when Israel reasserted its right to their homeland, for that time period, 586 BC to 1948, roughly 2,500 years, during that time period, the Jews were dispersed from their land, they were killed around the world, they were oppressed around the world, and for the Jews who did manage to stay living in that land of their homeland, they were dominated by another world empire. Here's the list, the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then the Byzantines, then the Arab Islamic Empire, then the Catholic Crusaders, then the Mamelukes, then the Ottomans, and then the British Empire. So because of all these various empires coming in, taking over the land after Jews were dispersed, they were killed, they were oppressed, it's no wonder that everybody's like, no, it's my land, no, it's my land, no, it's my land. We've got to look back at the history and realize that the Jews were there before any of this. So where then did the Palestinian people come from? Where is that word derived from? Okay, here's more history for you. Ready? AD 135. In AD 135, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, in order to quash a Jewish revolt, dispersed the Jews from Jerusalem. And then he renamed the entire region, in Latin, Palestina. Palestina, he named it because that's the Latin term for the Philistines. And why did Hadrian do that? Because the Philistines were the perennial enemies of the Jews. So Hadrian, as a way to dishonor the Jewish people after this revolt that they tried to uh, come against the Roman Empire, Hadrian quashed the revolt and said, now I'm going to take away Israel from the name of your land and I'm going to name it Palestina. For the Philistines as a way of dishonoring you. And from 135 AD when Hadrian decided that until 1948 when the Jews took their land back and gave it the rightful name that it had always been. From 135 AD until 1947 it was called Palestine. Because Hadrian renamed it. And thus Arabs living in that land were known as Palestinians. But listen, check this out. So were the Jews. The Jews were also called Palestinians until 1948. If you were born in Israel, say in 1947, or previously, when they were still issuing birth certificates, even if you were a Jew or an Arab, if you were born in that land in 1947, your birth certificate said Palestinian. 
There's some Jews still living today with a birth certificate that says Palestinian. Why? Because you're living in a land that Hadrian renamed in 135 AD. So the Arab people living in that region are now known as Palestinians, taken from a false name that Hadrian gave the region in deference to the Philistines and in opposition to the Jews. So that's where the name comes from. But listen, God said in Genesis 15, 18, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, to the descendants of the child of the promise, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, to the river Euphrates. God gave the title deed of this land to the Jewish people. Genesis 15, 18. Okay, we're talking 4,000 years ago. Let me just take you to the back wall and go over some things on the map so everybody can orient yourselves to what we're reading there in Genesis 15, 18. This is a map of the Middle Eastern region. What we just read there, what God's title deed to the Jewish people, Genesis 15, 18, the land was to go from the Nile to the Euphrates River. God's original intent for the Jewish people was to occupy a territory that looked roughly like this. 300,000 square miles. 300,000 square miles is roughly what God originally intended for the Jewish people to have. From the Nile River in Egypt to the Euphrates River that, that runs through Iraq and Syria. Israel never occupied this much land, even though God had deeded this to them, Genesis 15, 18. The Jewish people never occupied this amount of land. The largest the territory got was under the rule of King David, and his territory looked a little bit like this. In fact, the Bible says that his territory extended up to the north into parts of what today is Turkey. This is the largest that the Jewish people ever occupied in terms of a national homeland. Now... Fast forward to more recent history, because it goes from the Babylonians to the Greeks to the Romans. You have the Mamluks in there. You have the Ottoman Turks. Okay, the Ottoman Turks were occupying this land in, during World War I. And when Great Britain helped defeat the forces uh, that were fighting in World War I, Great Britain defeated the Ottoman Turks. Great Britain took back this territory. It was part of the British mandate. And in 1917, the Brits enforced a doctrine called the Balfour Declaration in 1917. Because they understood that the Jewish people had been dispersed, scattered, killed all around the world. And they needed to be able to return to their homeland. And everybody understood this was Jewish territory for 4,000 years. So in 1917, under the British mandate, they enacted the Balfour Declaration, and they determined that the homeland for the Jewish people should be this. This, this is the border of the 1917 Balfour Declaration. But in 1922, the Hussein family objected. An Arab family, the Hussein, said, we don't like the Jewish people having that much land. What about us? And so in 1922, Winston Churchill was the Secretary of State over the colonies of Great Britain. He wasn't Prime Minister yet. But as Secretary of State of the colonies, Winston Churchill took a crayon on a map and drew a line down the Jordan River, right about here. And he just indiscriminately, in order to appease the Hussein family, reneged on the promise of the Balfour Declaration, drew a line down the middle, said the, what, the east side will be called Transjordan because it's the side across the Jordan River. The west side will be Palestine. Still Palestine until 1948. The Hussein family, by the way, still controls that territory, which was permanently named in 1946 Jordan, as it is today. King Abdullah is part of the Hussein family. King Abdullah's full name is King Abdullah II bin al Hussein. So that's Jordan now on the east side of the Jordan River, and on the west side is Israel, which in 1948, when the United Nations recognized the homeland in 1947, then May the 15th, 1948, the Jewish people reclaimed their land and occupied now what is just a fraction of what God originally intended. This is what God originally intended. That was the land that they ended up with. 
And it's gone back and forth. The borders have gone back and forth with different wars. I'm not going to get into all that. Just wanted to give you the background to all of this because this is why I want everybody to understand when you look at history, the Jews are not colonialists. This is not a colony of any nation and they're, you know, they're paying taxes to some other motherland. Okay? They are the indigenous people. And they are living in this land, and again, not just because Great Britain said you can have the western side of the Jordan River, but because God deeded this territory and much more to them in Genesis chapter 15. Hallelujah. Question number four then. Why are so many American youth and young adults supporting the Palestinian cause today? Now, if you haven't already tuned me out, young adults, listen up, because you, 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 you need to learn something. I'm about to school you. I'm going to encourage you first, and then I'm going to school you a second, all right? Here's the encouraging thing. This generation of young adults is very concerned about humanitarian causes. You're concerned about, quote, the underdog or the disadvantaged or people without a voice. And you're to be commended for that. Don't ever stop caring for people who are disadvantaged. Um, you, because of your compassion for people, that's why you are quick to jump on certain causes, and you're passionate about these things. And so, you know, you want to end sex trafficking, and, and you want to, you know, end world hunger, and, and you're concerned about the environment, and all, these, and all these different causes, and all these different issues. And again, I just want to say, because you care about people, especially those who are disadvantaged, don't ever stop caring for people. Your compassion is needed. But now here's the challenge. Know why you are part of that cause and get your facts straight. Because sometimes you are quick to jump on the bandwagon of the latest cause, the latest issue, the latest group that appears to be disadvantaged, and you don't even know why you're a part of that cause, and you can't even intellectually defend it, and you end up looking silly. You look silly. Most young people, in fact, a lot of adults don't even know the history of the land of Israel I just shared with you. And so young adults are believing this false narrative. The Jews are the occupiers. The Jews are the colonialists. This is our land. You know, look, you can have compassion for the Palestinian people. Fine, you should. But don't forget what happened October 7, 2023. And stop trying to accuse the Israelis of being the ones who are the bullies. There are 22 Arab states, 52 Muslim states, one Jewish state. Who's the bully? You tell me. Who's the bully? Now look, I'm not defending everything that the Jewish people have done since 1948. Returning to their homeland was messy. It was met with resistance, there was war, and whenever there's war, it is messy. And unfortunately, the way they went about trying to repossess the land was messy. And there were Palestinian families who were displaced from their homes. And that created animosity even within the current generation of Palestinians against Jews. I've been up on the Temple Mount Hearing young Arab children chanting in Arabic, death to Israel. They're teaching their children to hate the Jews. And that will continue to happen until finally someone realizes, this is, this is the enemy, this is evil, this is wicked. So I'm not defending Israel on everything they've ever done. But to say that the land belonged to the Palestinians and that the Jews had never been there until they stormed it in 1948 and took it by force, that is simply intellectually dishonest, and it isn't true. And in addition, I'm going to say this to you young people too. I'm not done. Listen. <laughs> what feeds many young people, particularly those who care about humanitarian causes, what feeds a lot of times your desire to jump on to the latest humanitarian cause is because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. We all have a guilty conscience. And the only way to really assuage a guilty conscience is to go to God and have forgiveness through Jesus. 
But what happens is some people, in order to assuage a guilty conscience, they take up good causes. And young people are involved in something that is today referred to as moralistic therapeutic deism. What is that all about? In 2005, a Harvard doctor who now teaches at Notre Dame, Dr. Christian Smith, coined that term, moralistic therapeutic deism, to describe the young adult generation that is making a god out of humanitarian causes. The moralistic part is, I want to do good. Fine. But then when you do good, you feel good. That's the therapeutic part. And then you make a god out of it. That's the deism part. And it's a dangerous place to be. Because again, you start to jump on the bandwagon of the latest cause and the latest humanitarian thing. And you haven't done your homework and you don't know your facts. And you can't intellectually defend it and you end up looking silly. So instead of trying to get your feel good from this sense of humanitarian help, get your feel good from Jesus and get a relationship with God and stick close to him. And then you'll know what is good and right and pure. I'll end with question number five. How might any of this fit into Bible prophecy about the end times? Go to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. There's a lot of discussion right now about, you know, is this the end of the world and how does this all fit in and what does this mean? Anytime you see activity in Israel, especially when there's war, you should wake up. You should take notice. And you should look at your Bibles to try to understand what is going on. And in Ezekiel chapter 38, I'll read the first six verses. And then I'll share my thoughts on how this does or does not relate to current events. Ezekiel 38, 1 to 6. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. You see, circle in your Bible is Gog. Gog is a title. It means prince or lord, small l, or czar. And he's the prince of Magog over certain cities, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And God says to Ezekiel, prophesy against, prophesy against that guy. Verse 30, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Dugarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. The prophet Ezekiel goes on to say that these nations form a confederation and they advance from the north down to Israel and they attack Israel. The question is, are we seeing what is happening today in fulfillment of Ezekiel 38? I would say yes and no. Here's what I mean. First of all, it speaks here about Gog, who's the prince of this region, Magog. The ancient historians, Tacitus, Pliny, Josephus, they all said about Magog, it was the land of the ancient Scythians. When you look at a map, the land of the ancient Scythians was just north of the Caspian and Black Seas. We're talking Russia. This is a prophecy about Russia. And then there are five nations that join with Russia in this confederation against Israel. First on the list, verse 5, is Persia. Iran was called Persia until 1935. Iran's always been referred to as Persia historically until 1935. Iran was also an ally of the United States and Israel until the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran. The Shah of Iran was selling oil to Israel. But all that changed in 1979 when... Shia Muslims began to influence the whole country and thus influence and inspire Hamas and Hezbollah. Okay, listen. Hamas is fully funded, aided, and assisted by Iran. There's no question about it. In fact, Hamas has said that October 7th was directed by Iran. Hezbollah has said the same thing. Iran itself has said the same thing. They're behind October 7th. Why it is that our own federal government cannot say that Iran is behind October the 7th when they believe the Russian collusion stuff without even any evidence, but they can't believe this is a mind-boggling mystery to me. It's mind-boggling. I will hasten to say, however, as I said Wednesday night, give honor where honor is due. President Biden and Secretary of State 
Blinken have made very strong statements in defense of Israel, and I'm very thankful for that. Very thankful for that. You know, the Secretary of State is Jewish, so it helps to be Jewish and care about the Jewish people. They made strong statements. But you see a Russian-Iranian confederation coming together right now like never before, and Ezekiel prophesied it thousands of years ago. Could this be what we're seeing? Here's where I, why I say yes and no. This battle is in the south. It's coming from the south. It's not coming from the north. That's what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel also says that no one comes to Israel's defense. Well, we've come to Israel's defense. Other countries have come to Israel's defense. We got the USS Gerald Ford in the eastern Mediterranean ready to help in whatever way is needed. We've already released munition we had on site in Israel, the United States had. We've released these missiles as part of the Israeli defense system, the Iron Dome, so they have missiles that can target the rockets that are coming over from Gaza, more than 6,000 now. So we are involved. Ezekiel 38 says no one comes to Israel's aid and the forces come from the north. But here's how this could possibly be what we're about to see unfolding of Ezekiel 38. If you start to see Iran getting involved and telling Hezbollah from the north to start to fight as they fired a few rockets just to kind of show Israel they're there, if they start to engage, if Russia starts to send troops, okay, then it could be Ezekiel 38. But wait a minute, we're still helping. No one comes to Israel's aid. Here's the scenario under which I think the United States could pull out. Right now, again, we've made strong statements in defense of Israel. However, notice the language very carefully. Right now, you're starting to hear. The United Nations refuses to acknowledge Hamas as a terrorist organization. The UN has already been pushing back on Israel, as other nations have. Be careful now. So, you know, don't go in there too harsh. You know, watch what you're doing. You know, be nice. Be nice. You know, that's what they're starting to say. Even some among our government officials are starting to code word those kind of things. Like, be careful, as you're like, you know, watch out, don't, don't be too harsh. If other nations, including our own, begins to think that Israel is going in too harshly, they might pull out. We might decide we're not going to support Israel anymore. And here's other more frightening scenarios. Because of our ongoing efforts in supplies, to Ukraine and perhaps needing to get involved in China's potential assault against Taiwan. And here's even what is more of a potential. We have terrorists coming over our southern border in the United States. And on our own soil, there are these cells that we might end up having to fight. And if we have to end up engaging our own military here and there and everywhere, I'm not, I'm not making a statement whether all that is right or wrong. I'm just saying if we get stretched too thinly, the United States might very well wave at Israel and say, we got our own battles to fight. Sorry, we're not going to help you anymore. If you see those kind of things aligning, this could be Ezekiel 38. And let me tell you what happens between Ezekiel 38 and 39, the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. So all that to say, all that to say, be ready. Always be ready. Jesus said, lift up your heads and look up. Your redemption draws near. Jesus is coming again. So get right with God. Get your hearts right with him. And in the meantime, pray. Pray for Israel. Pray for the Palestinian civilians caught in the crosshairs. Pray ultimately for the Prince of Peace to come and rule and reign himself, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can look to you. We don't have to be afraid. We can trust you and know that you're coming soon. We ask you, Lord, in the meantime, to bring this war to an end quickly. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for innocent Palestinian civilians who are opposed to Hamas, who believe that Israel has a right to exist. So many people, Lord, who are being butchered and killed and we pray for grieving families. We pray for the Israeli troops. We pray, Lord, that many Jews and Muslims both would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Turn their hearts towards you, Lord. And until you come again, help us, Lord, to guard our hearts, knowing that you are our soon and coming King. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.
You know, one day, as he said, the whole world is going to turn against the nation of Israel. And when that happens, as he said, the rapture. The last words that Jesus spoke to the nation of Israel is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 23. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing? See your houses left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, This is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what he was talking about, of course, was that day, the end of the tribulation, when the Jews are scattered again, and when the Antichrist's mission is to get rid of them once and for all from the, from the face of the earth, and then when they realize that there's only one place to go, that's to turn to Jesus. That's when the Jews will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I know our time has gone over, but we have one short song to finish off with today. Nearly 3,000 years ago, God established this mountain as chief among all the mountains of the world. There are some higher, some grander, but none more lovely, because where the presence of the Lord is, there is true beauty. I believe that in the heart of God, ever since he established this city, he desired to have the people drawn out and called out, who would stream to the city to worship the true and living God. The shoe the Messiah said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks but you are not willing. And you will not see me again, Jerusalem, until you say to me, Baruch Abba, Hashem Adonai. And tonight we stand in the gap in this city proclaiming to him, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
Father, we can give you thanks today for the people of Israel, Lord God, the end of your eye. We will continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the children of Israel. That there will be peace within their walls. That you bless those who bless Israel, Lord God. And we thank you today that you bless Israel and you bless us, Lord God. We really thank you, Lord God. And it's your plans and purposes will always come to pass and come through, no matter what man may do or think they're doing. And like the disciples of old, we say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs>